You're listening to Love Talk Live with the relationship expert, Jamie Bronstein, only on L.A. Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to Love Talk Live. I'm your host, Jamie Bronstein. Today I have with me Gabriella Arato. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be interviewing you today. Gabriella is a matchmaker. So there's so much to talk about. I have so many questions, but I'm going to read a little bit about you first so that everybody can hear specifically what makes you, you, and what makes your services so spectacular. So Gabriella Martina Primavera Arato was born and raised in Berkeley, California, and has lived in San Francisco, New York, and Los Angeles. An outdoor and wilderness enthusiast, she now resides near Aspen, Colorado. Previous to making love as her full-time career, Gabriella worked in advertising, finance, and entertainment. She holds a BA in film studies from Cornell University and an MFA in writing from Columbia University. Within a few months of joining Talkify, America's fastest growing matchmaking firm, Gabriella became the, their most successful matchmaker with the highest number ever of engagements and marriages. Amazing. She is now the owner of KIS, which stands for Keeper Introduction Services, a boutique matchmaking firm with clients around the country, across the country. She was a featured presenter at the Matchmaking Institute's London 2018 Summit, speaking on matchmaking as a collaborative process. You can also see Gabriella matchmaking in action on the Learning Channel's hit show, um, I Am Shauna Ray, which was in 2022. So that was just, um, I actually, we'll talk about that. I, I saw some clips from that. Amazing. Um, and the singles who seek out Gabriella range from blue collar workers to billionaires, college students to those in their golden years. And and the whole rainbow of races and religions under the sun, Gabriella believes their desire to love and be loved is the universal tie to humanity and the very invitation to leading an exemplary life. And when I read that, that last line, I was like, that's like poetic. That's Thank poetic. you. <laughs> so I would love to know, and I'm sure everybody watching would love to know because I think it's so interesting. How did you get into this? Did you, were you born and you popped out and you're like, I'm going to be a matchmaker? Tell us your story. So I think like most matchmakers, I've always kind of been a natural connector. I've always liked putting people together. I remember, you know, it's like the world's sort of like a Rubik's cube in my mind. And I'm always going, oh, this piece should go here and this piece should go here. It's kind of controlling actually to think about it, but I like to order things in the ways that I think they should be ordered. And even in high school and in college, I was always going, you know, that Jimmy in dorm six, he really just would look so cute with Susie in dorm three. So my brain was sort of always wanting to do that. And I would put people out on dates and I was setting people up, but I didn't realize that there was actually a career in this. Um, so I'll tell you, it was about seven or eight years ago. I was like, I was like many people burnt out on internet dating. I was feeling very distressed about it. And then I saw an advertisement for a matchmaking company. And I thought, oh my God, this is such an incredible service. Like somebody picks dates for you and you just go on those dates. You don't have to swipe. You don't have to talk. You just show up at dinner and it's somebody else and their perspective and their professional. And God, I really, really could use this. So I whipped out my credit card and I was about to sign up for this service. And then I remembered that I had been out of the workforce for two years, taking care of someone in my family who was ill, and I hadn't earned any money in a while. And I thought, what am I doing? I, I shouldn't be putting things like this on a credit card. That's terrible. But I feel like I'd be good at this. So I wrote them a letter. It was probably two o'clock in the morning. I wrote them a letter and I said, I just read about your company. I saw your advertisement and I think I should come work for you. They called me the next day and they hired me that week. And that is how I started my matchmaking career. But what's interesting to me about it is that my own desire for the service is what put me in the service. Mm -hmm. And I really feel it. I really feel people's need for us. And I, 
I know people's need for you because me being the relationship coach and therapist that I am, I have so many clients that, and I'm going to be sending people to you. I already have referred you, but I have a lot of clients that they do the apps, they get frustrated, and then they do it for a while because it is less expensive than hiring a matchmaker. So they do these apps for a long time. They get really frustrated. They feel like it's this algorithm and they're getting sent all these not good matches and they do have to pay more money and then it just becomes a little, it seems very inauthentic to them. Mm -hmm. So then at that point they say, do you think I should try a matchmaker? And I do, I refer people all the time. Now this brings me to a question for you because some matchmakers are very specific to where they, where they are. Mm -hmm. So for instance, do you work with clients all over or do you mainly work with just Colorado? I work all over. I moved to Colorado two years ago. I'm a, I was born and raised in California. Um, I did my schooling mostly on the East Coast. So I kind of have roots in California. I was from San Francisco, but I lived a lot of my adult life in LA. And then I also was on, on the East Coast for years and years for school. So I sort of have my roots there, but I had always come to Colorado for some portion of the year every year, generally in the summer. I'm, I don't love skiing, but I do love hiking and I fly fish. So I would come out to Colorado and I really, it was, it, people say, oh, did you move because of COVID? I really didn't. And it was just coincidental that I decided to come kind of like lay down deeper roots in Colorado and some other things about just wanting to be more in touch with nature and bang for the buck versus LA and some other things like that. But my um, business is national. I work all over. I have clients in Miami and New York, Chicago, San Francisco, LA. I do take people in ski towns a lot just because I, because I live in one and not a lot of matchmakers live in a ski town and understand the mentality of people mm-hmm. who want to live in ski town. So I have people in Telluride, I have people in Aspen. Um, so, but I will work as long as they're, they'll work with me. So if somebody lives in a tiny little town somewhere, they probably need to be open to dating in their um, closest large city. In general, in the pool in small towns is very limited. And a lot of times people know everybody in the pool in their small towns. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and also, by the way, with COVID, one thing that did happen with COVID is that people got a lot more comfortable with Zoom dating. I have a couple married where he was in Chicago and I sent him out with a couple of women in Chicago. This guy, he was six foot six. So height was she could be as tall as as tall as I could get them. I found a couple of women who were six feet tall in Chicago, but they just didn't click. And then I found this six foot three woman living in Newark, New Jersey. And I called him up and I said, I know that you live in Chicago and you own a home in Chicago and you have a business in Chicago, but you're 36 and you don't have kids yet. And you don't yeah. have a custody agreement in Chicago. And she's in school, but she doesn't have kids yet either could I put you on a zoom call with her? And he said, okay. So I put them on a zoom call. He called me right after the call and said, that was the most incredible call of my life. He flew to see her the next weekend. He flew her to see him the weekend after that. And for the next nine months, they just got on an airplane every weekend, one or the other. And then nine months later, they married in Portugal in a cathedral. And last week they had their first baby. Oh my God. I could cry. So, you know, I feel like you should be open to dating in other places if you're not custodially tethered. Mm-hmm. If people custodially tethered, they probably shouldn't bother. I always say do not let geography stop you from being open because love is so worth it. Would yeah. you rather be stubborn and say and have all these rules? Or actually allow in for that possibility for you to be happier than you've ever been. Just yeah, and I I like allowing someone opening a door for you. What if what if you met someone who lived in Charleston? What if you met someone who lived in Greenwich? You know, these places might be you might come to love them and adore them. So my mom at seventy five met a seventy six year old on Match.com. My mom had a home in Colorado. He was a New Yorker, 
and was never going to leave New York. But after a few months of dating, they made an agreement and it's the agreement. They've been together now over six years and they moved in. They moved in together after two months. They've been together over six years and they made an agreement. And the agreement was that they were going to do May, June, July, and August in Colorado and the rest of the year in Manhattan. And he at first was kind of resistant to going to Colorado over the summer because he was just one of those New Yorkers who loved New York. He wasn't from there, but he had lived almost his whole life there. And yeah. now he loves his summers in Colorado. So, you know, people change and open up. You just got to show them what's good about where you want to be. You got you to gotta bring it. But also it's, it's you, it's the person, you know, if you're asking someone to live, if you're asking someone to live somewhere that they wouldn't necessarily have chosen themselves, but they fall in love with you and you're yes. there, yes. then it makes life fun no matter where you guys are. And you're talking about Colorado and New York, which are both great places. places. To be. So sounds yeah. like they both won in the love world and in the geography world. Yeah. And, you know, with my couple, the one where he was in Chicago and she was in Newark, what ended up happening with them was he owned a home in Chicago and he always thought, well, you know, if this works out, she'll move to Chicago. But in his visits to New York City to visit her, he fell in love with New York City. And now he rents out his house in Chicago and they live in New York together. You never that know. was the choice they made. But I say, don't cut yourself off. I do think it's easier to have a long distance relationship if you knew each other before or you lived somewhere um, together before and then something like work or something has to split you up. But in the world of FaceTime, it's kind of amazing how alive a relationship can, a relationship can stay just doing FaceTime calls. And that people have to do that all the time. People in the... People in the military, people who are, you know, if a movie director has to go and direct a movie, yeah. other kinds of work situations. And, you know, you get a lot from a FaceTime call, I think. You don't get physical intimacy, but you get to see somebody's facial expressions. You hear their voice, all of those kinds of things. You you do sort of feel a connection just from FaceTime. It's much easier with FaceTime than it is, say, through text messaging. Or just the phone. Or just the phone. And I, yeah, I'm all for that. I also, in addition, I all, I always encourage my clients to have that time before you actually meet as short as possible, because the truth is there is that energetic connection, that chemistry, whatever you want to call it, that you could have the best time talking on the phone and looking at the person. But when you're actually in person, there's that thing that you can't explain that's either there I totally or not. Agree. I tell people, yeah. you like a big mistake is to invest an enormous amount of mental and intellectual energy up front. And, you know, you might fall in love with someone's or start to feel something wonderful about somebody's wit or the way they formulate their sentences. Or even on a FaceTime call, you might kind of like, like their glow. But the truth of the matter is there is that pheromonal aspect. And there's something like the way people walk, their gait, yeah. their <laughs> smell, all of those kinds of things. You really need to get how they eat their food. <laughs> How they eat their food is important. I've noticed a lot of people when they eat, they use their hand instead of their utensil. This is like a normal thing that happens. It happens to be a pet peeve of mine. And if I'm at the dinner with a guy and he's like pushing the food around on the plate with his fingers, what? it's not a deal breaker. I wouldn't end a relationship for it, but it definitely is something a lot of people, like now that I notice it, it's one of those things a lot of people do. And you'll notice those things in person with someone that you would never notice on a FaceTime call because Although, you're not going to be seeing somebody interact with their food on a plate. But this is such a great idea that both of us should do that we should encourage our clients, have a meal, have a meal on have FaceTime. On, yeah, you could, um, although like the plate would be- I know, you won't be able to see the plate. Have a question. What was the food item? I mean, French fries is a different thing or a hamburger. What was the food item that this man was pushing around with his hand? Well, I've just noticed this with a lot of people in general, they'll kind of like, they'll take their fork and let's say they have some food left on the plate. And instead of say, take, taking their knife and pushing it on the fork, they'll just take their hand and do it. And I think- you know, we're not in England. We weren't raised with like the Queen's manners. We're not, 
we weren't in, um, you know, we don't, I think a lot of Americans in general, we don't have very strict table manner laws in the ways that they do in certain other countries. I dated a British guy once and he was very specific about where he laid his fork and knife on his plate right. during the meal and after the meal. And there was a whole set and I consider myself a relatively mannerly person, but I'm telling you, there's a whole set of table manners that I never learned that all of, you know, the UK yeah. follows. And so some of it is cultural too. And some of it might even be state by state where the certain states are more used to finger foods than other states. So I right. don't... I don't judge anyone for what they do, but you may have particular pet peeves and you may want to know that you're going to have to either live with them or communicate about them. And we're talking about things that are definitely more surface. Like when I was talking about the energy and the chemistry, that's way more important than these things. Those are things that people could, I think, get over and compromise on. Yeah. Um, but by the way, it's, like, it's a sort of an interesting question to me. I think sometimes people nitpick about things because they generally aren't interested in the person. And then sometimes I think those things themselves matter. And it's hard to tell the difference. It's like, do you not like the way he wears his hair because you're really not interested in him? Or would you actually be genuinely interested in him if he didn't wear his hair that way? And th that can yeah. be actually kind of hard to tell. I think that's a really good thing to bring up for our viewers right now because for instance, specifically real time right now, I have a client who is dating a guy who's a bit older than her and it bothers, there are a few things that bother her and I would love your feedback and I can share this with her. So a few things, and also it's going to be inspirational to anybody who's watching. So a few things that bother her are, um, he doesn't take as good care of himself. He kind of has like dad bod or whatever. Okay. He's about 10, a little bit over 10 years older than her. She's late thirties. He's older than that. So okay. That's something that bothers her, his like um, the things that he eats and also the style of his, where he lives. It's very old. It's like 20 years from when he had kids, blah, blah, blah. So these are things and I am, I ask her these questions, exactly what we're talking about. I'll say, I'll, I'll challenge her. I'll say, okay, if he did it up, like just to get to the heart of how do you feel about him? Yeah. Yep. It's a very fine line. So what would you say some advice to this particular client and anybody else who's listening, who's grappling with trying to figure out, do I love this person? Can I get over these other things, et cetera? Well, you know, with this particular case, I would say the fact is he's older. He's a decade older and she's picking up some flavors of what feels old to her. Right. Yeah. She's not complaining about the fact that the house is messy or the fact that he um, stays out late drinking. No. It's very specifically that she's complaining about things that feel old and dated. And I do think in some ways she's working through an age differential. And, you know, as much as people like to say age is just a number Age is really important in dating. It's just very important. And I think I think some of what's going on for her is she's contending with a man who's a decade older than she is. And, and so she's like I was saying, she's only, almost going to pick up on the things that are feel, old feeling. Like I'll bet you if he had, so for example, if he had hung a fresh, youthful piece of art in her house, in his house, she may not even notice it. She might not even be like, oh, that's like very, very hip because right now her brain is focusing on the fact that it's, it's a guy who's 10 years older and she's not sure she's comfortable with this. And, sh and he has made some great compromises. He's being healthier. It's also like, because he's older, she wants him to be healthy so that he could actually live a longer life. If they, if she decide if they decide to be together. That's right. Um, well, you know, women outlive men by right, yeah. years. So in general, and obviously there's unique circumstances all of the time around this because people can pass away at any time for any reason. But statistically speaking, women outlive men. And so if the truth of the matter is, if you were going to tr date to try to die at the same time, women should actually be dating men about five or six years younger than they are. And then yeah. you're probably going to like age and die at the same time. Yeah. So the truth of the matter is 
she she probably if she does end up with him if we're just looking at statistics she's going to end up at the end of her life with several years without him or and and possibly and very likely without a partner because it just gets very hard to partner you know at that point but in any case um i think that she's correct but all of it comes down to the fact that the energy his energy is not as youthful as her energy well let's rewind for a second for anybody else who is older you had a great example of your mom and your mom's boyfriend that were 70. You said your mom was 76 when she met him, right? My mother was 75 and he was 76. Okay. And I helped my, my mother write her match.com profile. So I'm going to tell you what I told her to do. Because I do think, especially for women, it gets harder as women age because men get more ageist. That is the statistic truth. There's a lot of data on this. So this is what I had my mother do in her match.com profile. I had her shave off a few years on her age. And then in the body of the profile, I had her say, by the way, the, the age I listed isn't my real age. Because when you're as you know sexy and desirable as I am, you don't need to put your age. And by the way, a lady like me doesn't tell her age anyway. And then I had my mother put a picture of herself up in a skirt just above her knees, it was about an inch above her knees. And the last line of her profile said, and if we get along, you're gonna see a whole lot more of these legs. My mother was viewed by, I think it was 500 or 600 men in a couple of weeks that were around her peer group. Would those men have looked at her and responded yes. to her if she had put her real age? Probably less. And I've never questioned my mother's boyfriend as to whether she would have even come up in his age cutoff. I don't know. But, you know, fortunately for my mother, you know, she had a great figure and she's, you know, kept herself looking really good and all of those kinds of things. So it worked out. It worked out for them. And I, you know, for me, I tell people all the time, if I could have a magic wand and sort of like go out and spread my fairy dust and change anything at all about the dating world, it would be to not have so much ageism and largely on the part of men having so much ageism because it throws the whole game off for everybody. Right. But at the same time, you also were saying that age is an important factor when there's a huge age difference. But if yeah, it's just a few Lord years, I hear what you're saying. You're yeah, saying mostly, if it's a few years, yeah, it's not a big deal. Yeah, and mostly what I find is just in general, and this is statistically true, as men age, they want the larger and larger age differential. So men, when they're when I have a client come to me and he's 27, he is usually totally open to dating men, uh, dating women who are 33. He's willing to go three, four, five, six years older if she's the right woman. In my seven years of doing this, I have never had a man in his, say, mid-50s who has told me that he would meet a woman in her early 60s. Now, of course, when people are hiring matchmakers, they get particularly picky because they're putting money on the line. And maybe if he goes out into the world or goes out into a bar, he's less concerned around age. But in general, what we find, and the, the statistics I'll show this, is that women tend to go from liking men a little bit older. So a 25-year-old woman will like like a 27-year-old guy. And by the time a woman is in her 40s, 50s, and 60s, she tends to like a man who's slightly younger. So she goes from liking men two or three years older. Over the course of her life, she tends to like men two or three years younger. But as men age, typically, they just want that age differential bigger and bigger and bigger. And it gets very complicated. And these guys, I think they shoot themselves in the foot a lot by cutting themselves off from really good candidates to date and throwing off the whole kind of dating market for everybody. It's really exhausting. I don't know if there's a matchmaker in the world who wouldn't concur with what I'm saying right now. We all sit around and talk about how we're going to get out of this problem. Yes. I think that like, it's just making me think of my own experience of having rules and being not open to different ages. And I remember when I was, so I'm, I'm la I was laughing also as you were saying this, because I was going to say that 
my husband is one year and 17 days younger than I am. So, which is, was a big, so I didn't, and I also didn't meet him until I was 34. So everybody out there, I know girls are, they feel like they're getting so old when they get blah, 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 blah. Didn't get married until I was 37. I had my, we had my son when I was like 38 ish. I don't remember, 38 ish. Okay. Anyhow. So, but I remember distinctly when I was 28 years old on my birthday at my birthday shindig in LA, I kissed a guy who was 24, four years younger than me. And I had never gone younger. Mm -hmm. And it was like some of my friends that were younger, it was their friend. And then all of a sudden through the universe, I met at some deli, like a week later, I met this guy, this really adorable boy, boy who was four years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And he ended up being my boyfriend. And so because I had those experiences, it helped me to open up to younger guys. And then I probably, if that never happened, I wouldn't have been open to my husband who's one year Mm -hmm. younger. So I think that people need to just like dabble and like try different ages to see that it's about the person and not the age, except for what you're saying when they're, and there's the, there's the Catherine McPhee's and the David Foster's of the world. I believe they're in love. They're like 30 something years apart. So absolutely it totally depends. I had a boyfriend, my, my biggest age differential, uh, one of the years that I lived in LA, I had a boyfriend who was 14 years older than I was. He had a son and the year after I dated him, I ended up dating a guy who was significantly younger than I was. In fact, he was only a couple years older than my previous boyfriend's son. So I went from a man in his mid fifties to a guy in his early twenties in the course of two years. And I dated each of them a year. So I've really spanned the age difference. My personal preference is to date as close to my own age as I possibly can. I think a year younger is like great because for me, there is a lot of value in dating your peer. But then like we talked about, like love sort of happens. What I wish is that more men were open to dating their age range, their age group and their peer instead of being as they age more and more focused on dating younger and younger. Yeah. And who knows if that will ever change. It might not. But at the end of the day, if we just trust that everything is meant to be regardless and everybody is going to be with who they're supposed to be with regardless, then then that's just how it's supposed to be. It might not ever change. Yeah. And- I do think in the out in the dating and love world, there's kind of a mass surrender we need to do. Yes. <laughs> you know, you can take as much action as you want to take. You can read all the books. You can do everything. Yes. But at the end of the day, there is sort of something, is it in your cards or is it not in your cards? And you have to do a combination of both taking action and doing everything in your power and then just giving up. And I don't mean giving up with action. I mean, giving up spirit. I give giving up to this, to the spiritual reality that, that, you know, you may have a destiny for you that is beyond your knowledge and you might have to surrender to that destiny. And that can be a very hard thing to do. I say it's not giving up. It's giving over. Giving over is a better way to put it. Giving over. It's saying, Jesus, take the wheel (laughs) saying, you know, I'm doing everything I can. Now I'm going to, cause it is so control is an illusion and a lot of people, and they don't even realize that they're trying to control so much. So it's that like letting go of the reins just a little bit. Right. And, And it's also saying, I think I know what's the best for me. I know what I want, but I'm going to trust that something going on up there around here knows what I need more than what I want. So we're having it's the same thing that we're saying. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is a lot of times the thing that people want has been the thing that has led them to all of it not working out. Exactly. Exactly. And, How's and the bottom it? line is it's it's sometimes it's hard. It's like when a writer has trouble editing their own words. Sometimes it's hard actually to see who you are in the world in the ways, this is why I think matchmakers can be good. It can be hard to see who you are in the world in the ways that other people might see you and other people might sort of see a possibly good fit for you. That's very hard for you to see because you don't actually have perspective on yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And then you can try a different flavor and suddenly things are really working the way they never worked before. But getting over that hump's really difficult. Well, another thing that with my husband as an example, I, all of my boyfriends were Jewish. I'm Jewish. All all of my boyfriends were always Jewish. My husband is Catholic. I met him on match and I was open to it. He happens to be very handsome. Okay. That helps. Very smart. So he had all these qualities. And so I was like, am I going to let, and he, he was open to raising our future child. We didn't obviously on a first date or whatever, or like in the conversations, um, to raising a child. Jewish. So okay. like I was like, am I going to just because of that, you know, because of religion. So that's another thing that I try to encourage people to. And of course, there are those people that know exactly for sure, 100 percent. I want somebody in my religion. That's that's great. They do. They do. Um, but sometimes it works out if you're open you know, to other religions. Yeah, I'm Jewish and I go out on dates with men who aren't Jewish all the time. I think at the end of the day, and I don't mind someone who does something like goes to church. I think at the end of the day, children, it's really important if you're planning to have children together to have a game plan. Okay. Even if the game, my my brother, my now late brother um, was Jewish and married um, someone who was Catholic. She wasn't practicing Catholic, but their agreement was that they would expose the children to multiple religions and let the children children gravitate naturally to what the children wanted to gravitate to. And so that's what they did. So I think you've got to have a game plan. It would be hard for me, for example, to be with someone who fundamentally felt that Jesus was our savior. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're going to burn in hell. That's probably not a good fit for me. But what would be a good fit for me is someone who said, I have a relationship with divinity and I call it Jesus and going to church lifts my spirit and my soul. And I would say Sunday morning's great. You go to church on, I'm going to go, you know, do my thing. (laughs) You know, as long as you guys are on the same page about it, then I think the the mixing of religions can actually be very, um, it can actually be um, a a benefit. Because you're, and you learn from each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is about communication. Make sure I always say it's so important to have financial, political, religious. You have to have these hard conversations before you decide to spend. You should before you decide to spend your life with someone, specifically, most importantly, the financial. I was about to say, so I am obsessed with financial transparency. And I will tell you, a lot of people don't like it. A lot of people are very, very, very nervous around it. A lot of my male clients are really in a state of like paranoia around it. And I just think that it's really important that the two of you align in uh, in certain choices about lifestyle and have an understanding about how it, things are going to work financially. And if you're sitting around worried about what somebody's going to do, I, I don't know if you're going to get to that financially transparent conversation. I think it's a very important one to have because m- money is, you know, money is how we operate in society. It's so important. And it's, I think that it's the number one cause of relationship breakdown slash divorce whatever. It's a, it's a huge, it becomes a huge problem if you're not on the same page. There's so much resentment, contempt, anger. Um, so it's so much better. You know, you, for me, it's there's always going to be something. Yeah. But- you know, it's not even for me. I realized too, I, I really like practicing what I call like abundant mentality. And mm-hmm. I can meet men who probably earn more than I do. In fact, this has happened before. I've met men who out earn me they have a higher net worth than I do, but they they live in financial scarcity mentality. And that itself is a deal breaker for it's me. so unattractive. It's I can't, so I don't want to live in scarcity right. mentality. Right. So the truth of the matter is those kinds of things, it's not just how do we spend and what do we earn and what can we afford, but it's what's our attitude towards money. Mentality, yeah, attitude, yeah. Um, I happen to watch the show Married at First Sight. Highly recommend it. I personally watch it because I think it's fascinating to watch. It's like an experiment to watch two people. It's it's fascinating. And and they, the coaches and the the Reverend and the Dr. Pepper, she's a sociologist. It's very interesting to me. Anyhow, um, there is this one couple where the girl, the man is a fireman. He's 
gorgeous, so sweet, and he's charming. He's a wonderful man. He's a fireman, and the girl earns more than him, and she loves to go shopping and wants to travel. And there's actually two couples currently. I'm watching a few seasons ago um, where the girl wants to do more traveling, and the guy wants to, like, money save Boba, penny pincher thing. So um, it is very interesting to watch because I, I – at the same time. And so it's going to be interesting to see like if they end up together. Um, but they are having these conversations and then the ca- the camera will, will show them saying, I just don't know if it's going to work, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because you don't know what they're going to decide. But I, I always say that in a relationship, you should compromise, but you should never sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Sacrificing means like seriously doing something that does not feel comfortable with you. Mm-hmm. You are getting out of your integrity. So great. compromise, great. Sacrifice, not so much. In that case with the fireman and the woman who has more money, I would say a couple different things could happen. Um, she could take some trips with her girlfriends that she self funds. Um, she could offer, if she wants to stay in a five star hotel and he can only offer a three star hotel, he could set his budget at what he's willing to pay hotel wise. And she could say, okay, I'm going to pick up the bridge. Um, right. Other thing that can happen with a couple like that, I think is you know, if she's earning a lot more and he's earning something, what's the possibility that they create a small business together where they maybe sell something on Etsy or do something like that? And then they create some extra money that gets to be part of those things. So I do think when there are two people together, there may be adjustments, but some of it is just being solution oriented. And I think it depends once again about attitude. Like, let's say, she says she wants to go on some trip somewhere and he says, well, I don't want to spend the money. She said, okay, I'll pay the rest of it. Then he needs to, um, to not be resentful about it and to not feel less of the, of a man oh. and to also not be calling her princess all the time. Cause he calls her princess and she's not in a nice out. way. You mean not in like, Oh my princess. Well, well, like no, in a, no. a derogatory way. Yes, but at the same time, I love this man. Like, he's such a good guy. He does it in, like, a joking way, but okay. now it's getting towards they have, like, a week left to the side. And so now it's getting a little more – he's saying – he thinks that she's a brat, basically. Right, right. I mean, sometimes, like, a teasing – so that kind of teasing is very distinctive. There are individuals who really enjoy being teased like that, and there are other individuals where they're they're plastering on a smile and they're pretending they're, they're liking it, but it actually – is in it's a masked insult and it's and it's hurtful and i think that that's just person by person you got to know your person but um you know his way of calling her princess is also his own self-protection and it might be his way of contending with the fact that he's not a huge earner and so the way to bring it down the way to make himself not feel badly about that is to knock her down a little bit for wanting a certain lifestyle who knows but it's gonna be so interesting to see and I will let you know. I'm sure you're yeah, dying. I know. <laughs> I, what I, watch is, um, I think it's called Love is Blind. And it's the one where they're in the pod. Oh no, we're waiting for another I season. Love. There's only been two so far. Right? There's only been two seasons. And I'm, I I love it so much. It's Wait, fascinating. Did you watch The Ultimatum? I did. Okay. So that. Yeah. Okay. So we only have, um, we need to finish within the next five minutes. I need to ask one more quick question for to help you um with business, um, not that you need help, you're doing so well. Um, but anyhow, just for people watching. So do you work where you have a pool? Like, can somebody sign up with you as just to be in your pool? Yes. And they don't pay you anything. Correct. Then you they get set up on dates. Yes. And someone else pays. So like- it's completely free to enter my private singles database. You do it through my website, keeperintros.com, like you're my keeper. And um, keeperintros.com, it's totally free. And I'll tell you who will see, if you put a profile in with me, who will see it? I will see it. Uh, The Ukrainian engineers who run the database service that all the matchmakers use called Smart Match App, they'll probably see it, but don't worry, they're a little busy right now. And then the other people who will see it is I might submit your profile to a client of mine. I also might submit your profile to another matchmaker. If I hear of another matchmaker saying, hey, does anyone know women in their cities who live in Philadelphia and you're in my database, I might submit. So another matchmaker might see it and they might show it to a pro to a to a potential client. So all of this is to say it's not public facing, but there may end up being, say, 10 people who see this profile. It's completely free to enter. 
You may never hear from me, but if you do, I'll call you up and I'll say, Hey, I have a client and this is about my client or an, or I might write you an email and say, I just showed your profile to another matchmaker. Her name is so-and-so she lives in San Diego. And are you comfortable with me passing your phone number onto her? She'd like to call you and, and discuss her client with you. So that is a 100% free way to work with me and with other matchmakers. Yeah. And it can't, like, it can't hurt. It can't hurt. It There's okay. no, yeah. um, I'm going to tell people about this. And also there are sp the three specific people that just reached out to me via Facebook. I had just written a comment to somebody because they had posted about their brother. And I said, um, I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. And I, I if I think of somebody, because I love fixing people up, I'm not a professional matchmaker. And then because I wrote that comment, a few other people wrote um, either, oh, can you help me? And, you know, or I know this person. So it was very sweet. So I might reach out to you on behalf of those people to see if you have anybody for them. I would love that. Um, okay. So everybody knows you can hire Gabriella or Gabby to be your matchmaker, or you can just go into your, the database. What is your database again? Keeperintros.com. Like KISS, Keeper, Intro, Keeper Introduction Services is KISS, but the website is either Keeper Introductions or Keeper Intros. Like you're my keeper. Dot com. Yep. And um, what is anywhere else, your socials, your, if you have any other websites, anywhere that people can contact you? I do have um, a LinkedIn. I'm also on Instagram at keeperintros.com. The truth of the matter is I, I'm, I should probably really up my social media game. Largely I post um, on Facebook through my personal Facebook account, which is Gabriella Arito, which is my name. But you know, if you write me a message over my Facebook account and you just say, Hey, I heard you and I'd love to be your Facebook friend, then I'll, I'll I'll take your request and you can be my Facebook friend. And on my Facebook page, I also do post single people. Um, and I'll be like, oh, this is so-and-so and they're looking. So I, I use my Facebook page a lot to put right. people up there too. And I show sometimes display with their permission, some of the people who are in my network and nobody can sort of believe just the incredible singles that I know. I mean, they're fabulous. I know. I remember that. I saw that guy in LA. I wanted to fix him up. And yeah, we'll check in about that. Um, okay. And as always, everybody can reach me. Find me. All my information is at therelationshipexpert.com. Gabriella, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So inspirational. You gave us so much information. Um, I'm guessing you'll get you'll be getting some calls. I hope so. Or whatever. I, I live for um, this. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Join us every Monday, 2 p.m. Pacific on Love Talk Live and Ali Talk Radio. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Jamie. You're listening to Love Talk Live with the relationship expert, Jamie Bronstein, only on LA Talk Radio.